We're ready. We'll begin. Uh, welcome you all tonight to the uh, February regular scheduled board meeting for USD 298. Uh, nice to see a crowd of people here. Uh, a couple things before we approve the agenda. We need to add item 5A. Go down to 5, add 5A under that pre-K through 3 presentation. A pre-K through 3 presentation. And then if you'll go down to number 10 after the superintendent report, we're going to add in item 10A. We're going to add an executive session for negotiations. If you can add in an executive session for negotiations at 10A. And with those changes, I would accept the motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Bree, seconded by Jessica to adopt the agenda. All in favor? Opposed? 6 0. Okay. No donations. Okay. We'll move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda for tonight has the approval of the minutes. Um, you'll find the minutes from the regular board meeting of January 10th in your packet, and then you should all have a copy of the January 31st minutes at your spot. We'll approve both of those. The payment of the bills, treasurer's <coughs> report, clerk's report, um, a rec commission report. If you haven't found that, that would be under the red tab under addendums. Um, addendum 1, in the back of your packet. And then we need to accept track on donations and other track donations. Uh, the trackathon donation would be in the amount of $5,352 and a track <coughs> donation of $1,000 from Jean Gillis. Gillis. <coughs> so that's the consent agenda. Any other comments on that? Discussion? Accept a motion to approve all of that. I so move on the consent agenda. Okay. Okay. Motion by David, seconded by Jason, to approve the items listed on the consent agenda, consisting of <clears throat> the approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of January 10th, 2022, the special meeting of January 31st, 2022, approve the payment of the bills, approve the treasurer's report. Approve the clerk's report, approve the Lincoln Rec Commission report, and approve the LES trackathon donations in the total amount of $5,352 and a track donation of $1,000 from Gene Gillis. We thank both of them for their contributions. Any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? 6 0. That brings us on to a Spanish presentation by Mrs. Holman. Okay, well thank you for having me today. Um, I am very excited to be able to present um, about how Spanish is going in the grade school this year. Um, I'm very excited. I think a lot of the kids are very excited um, and really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun this year. It's my presentation will work. So far, these are some of the topics that we've covered. We've covered 12 different topics about telling our name, exchanging greetings, expressing how they're feeling, identifying colors, counting to 10, um, identifying shapes and how many sides each one has, what day it is, month it is, season it is, what the weather is like, um, major body parts, talking about clothing, identifying different members of their family. So far, uh, we have a total number of words and or phrases equaling over 115 new words and phrases that they have learned in Spanish class so far this year, which is really awesome, and they're doing a fantastic job. Um, we, we've learned over 22 new songs, um, half of which are authentic songs that they would hear if they were growing up in a Spanish household or in a Spanish country. Um, 
maybe. <laughs> I have a, a couple of videos of them singing as well, but I'm technologically challenged. Um, so it doesn't always the reason I don't teach technology, because it doesn't obviously it skip to the very end. <laughs> so if they work, we will see. Uh, I was working on getting this loaded for like several hours, and it didn't always work for me. So I'm I'm glad to see that they are at least kind of showing up. And again, these are from different points throughout the year. These are not just recently. This is obviously uh, one of those times when we had to wear our masks. Like I said, if it will play, <coughs> we will see. <laughs> so here's just some of our fourth, one of the fourth grade groups um, singing one of the songs that we learned. Now I can't remember which song it is. <laughs> One of my, one of their favorite songs to sing and dance to. opportunity to be able to be down there with them. It's a lot of fun and it's, it's very exciting to see them, how they've grown just in this short amount of time. So, gracias por permitirme a presentar and for allowing me to do it. <laughs> Thank any you. Questions? Do we have questions? I, don't know. <laughs> I would make sure that everyone understands how appreciative we are that that uh, opportunity is available for those kids. When I go over there at lunch and they come up and greet me in Spanish. It's just an exciting program. So thank you for taking that on. I love it. And if you have your uh, fourth or fifth grade student come home with a different name, uh, Mrs. Holman gives them, they pick different names, and they'll be walking down the hallway and they're talking about Guillermo and Paco, and I'm like, who are Guillermo and Paco? And it's their names. And as they go out during the day, she greets all of them with their Spanish name. And I always say to Mrs. Holman, how do you keep their regular names and their Spanish names apart? It's amazing to me that you can remember them. So I, as a principal, am so proud. I just think it's an amazing program what they did in such a short amount of time. So. Yeah, that's kind of tricky, keeping their names straight now, because they keep wanting to change them. I'm like, oh, God, stop. <laughs> like, I know you as three different names now, and I, I, don't, I call them, I'm like, Paco, Rico, Guillermo, Pablo, Jackson. <laughs> I don't even know which one to call you anymore. So, yeah, it's been really good and really fun, and I really appreciate being able to be down Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have a pre-K through three presentation. Sorry about that. I had to get my computer plugged in before you died.
last year, right about this time, I also presented to the board. And so I asked Mr. Crenshaw if I could do this presentation again to talk specifically about preschool. Um, preschool in Kansas is funded and it's structured differently. It isn't how other programs, K-12, are funded or structured. So I wanted some time to talk about that. I also wanted to talk about child care. And you're probably going to think how are preschool and child care mixed together. But I promise if you give me a little bit of time, I will show you how the two things are interconnected. I also want to recognize two people. So Kelly Gorley from the Economic uh, Development Council came over tonight to, to talk about this issue of child care and what it means, not just for the school district, but also for the county. And Mrs. Ringler, our preschool teacher, is here to answer any questions as well as we kind of work through these various issues. So just a reminder, there are five Kansas CAM competencies that Dr. Randy Watson and the State Board of Education have adopted. Kindergarten readiness is one of them, and that means by the time that that student enters kindergarten in August, they're ready to go academically and socially um, with their same age peers. So some of these, if you see sometimes um, we have a star in high school graduation or post-secondary effectiveness, those are actually based on data points Kindergarten readiness is not. It's based on self-reported data, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So we have all of the components in USD 298 to start meeting that kindergarten readiness data and be able to collect those stars. We just have to kind of finalize the pieces. So kindergarten readiness, as I said, is measured by self-reported parent data. It's <coughs> called the Ages and Stages Questionnaire. That's required. All parents and guardians have to report that data by our count date of September 20th, and then uh, Mrs. White enters it at the end of the year. This year, we're gonna do something a little bit differently. We're gonna collect that data early. We're gonna apply for a special waiver to do that after April 1st. It is very important to have that data of those students that are coming up for kindergarten, from preschool, so we can properly plan for our budget, our at-risk funding, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and also our class size. We're going to start hosting, Mrs. Ringler and I, probably to uh, late March, sometime into April, some early childhood information nights. So we can start reaching out to those families to talk about three-year-old preschool, four-year-old preschool, kindergarten. Um, also, if we can get this data done early, as I said, it's just very helpful in the planning process. So if I, one of the things I will say as this goes out, so if you have a family with a three-year-old or a four-year-old child, please call the Elias office. You can speak to Mrs. Fenn, who's our secretary, and she has a list of questions to go through just so you can get on that planning list. So we know what those three-year-old, four-year-old, and kindergarten uh, classes will look like next year. It's just really important. When we talk about kindergarten readiness and why it's so important to be ready by the time you start, is there's the idea of retention or holding back. That's kind of an outdated idea, and it's no longer supported by the Kansas State Department of Education. It doesn't mean that it can't be done. It's just no longer supported. Now, we have to have specific data that shows why did we hold this student back, <coughs> back in first grade? Why did we hold this student back in third grade? So we really have to be able to have that student ready to go with their classroom peers so they're, so they're not retained. And there's a huge financial consideration for this as well. So if a student is five years old by August 31st, so maybe they started in four-year-old preschool, they weren't quite academically ready to move to kindergarten, and now they did another year in four-year-old preschool, and then they move on to kindergarten, we lose funding for that student. They're only funded as a half-time kindergartner. So as I said, there is that financial push as well, also, the social, emotional, and academic pieces there, we need those students ready to go, and that's where three-year-old and four-year-old preschool comes in. So, in Kansas, some districts self-fund their preschool. Some charge admissions fees. Most districts, particularly districts like ours that are a Title I district, receive funding for their four-year-olds that are deemed at risk. So, if their students, on the count date are deemed at risk, they get half percent or half time regular student funding. They also get a full transportation rating if they're transported both ways. Now, if a student is on an IP, they don't get that funding. That's a different funding source. 
And there used to be a lottery system, so maybe we would actually have 12 students that met at-risk criteria, but we were only granted four slots. We were only uh, funded for those four slots. After COVID happened, that has went away. So right now, if I have 15 <coughs> students enrolled in four-year preschool and 12 of them meet at-risk criteria, I can be funded for all 12 of them. That's totally different. There are 10 categories in preschool for at-risk funding. And an important thing to know is, we call it at-risk students, but preschools are not designed for at-risk students, but most of the students, 90% of the students that we will have will meet one of those criteria, <coughs> and we can receive the half-time funding for that. If you have a question, just, just ask. Uh, our our four-year-old preschool program, as of right now, uh, it goes through an approved application that takes place every April. Three-year-old goes through in April as well. So if we're funded half-time at-risk four-year-olds, we have to agree to certain assurances. We, uh, this used to have several things down here. A lot of them have been taken away, like the amount of staff members that are needed. After COVID, we're getting into teaching shortages. They've changed that. The one thing that does have to stay is a student must attend 465 hours. Kindergarten students also have to attend 465 hours. Obviously, if you're going full-time kindergarten, you're going way over that number. <coughs> that's the minimum that they're required to attend in Kansas. Three-year-old preschool. So for this year, we just have three-year-old preschool one day a week on Wednesdays. We did not charge those students because we received no funding for them. They also cost us a minimal amount because they're there two and a half hours. So this year's three-year-old preschools, if I could have had them go longer and meet the 465-hour requirement, we would have made an extra $28,800 based on at-risk funding. But I didn't have them for the full-time requirement. So the proposed idea is to expand three-year-old preschool to five days per week, only with the morning session. A lot of that's just due to age. We would cap that number or keep that number, as we have this year, about 10 to 12. 12 would be about our highest level for a class, again, based on age and productivity. And four-year-old preschool would run simultaneously five days per week in the morning. Um, at this time, I don't have enough four-year-old students to make two classes. Obviously, that could change as we do those early childhood education nights. We'd love to pick up families. I think those families are out there. We're just going to have to go to them to get them in. So we'd have one teacher teaching three-year-olds five days per week and one teacher teaching four-year-olds five days per week. One of the things we're required to do to receive at-risk funding is we have to work with our local interagency coordinating council. For us, that is the Mitchell County Partnership for Children. Uh, that's a part of the Mitchell County, or the Beloit County, Beloit District, I was going to say Beloit County District, the Beloit District. Uh, Brady Bean, who's the elementary principal, is the head of the Mitchell County Partnership for Children. They apply for every year through the state of Kansas a block grant. So we, we don't receive any funding from them. We also don't pay them anything. But what that does is it provides early childhood <coughs> specialists in a vast array of areas that are coming out to work with our students. It also provides our assessment and our testing tools, which is called the MIGDs, which is a pretty expensive test. We don't pay for that. And then there's professional development throughout the year for our preschool staff. And Mrs. Ringler can talk about that because she participates in that professional development, which is, is outstanding. The Mitchell County Partnership for Children has recommended a full three-year-old preschool model, and they would also like us to apply for what's called preschool pilot funds. We have not, in this district, applied for those in the past. I did go ahead and apply for those this year. And I'll tell you about those, because that's a different funding pool from preschool at-risk funds. Uh, special ed services, which are a large piece of this. So once any child within USD 298 turns three, the federal mandate says we, as the public school district, have to find them if they have a disability that they're being served. The burden falls on us. Even if that child will be homeschooled, even if that child will not be going to our district. That special ed burden falls and bears to the local school, school district. So 298 was the last school in the special education co-op to have a three-year-old preschool model. We were also the last school to have all the kindergarten services. 
Most schools adopted all day kindergarten 15 or 20 years ago. This year's fourth graders would be that first group. So they're making tremendous progress, but it is going to take some time to see that growth of all day early childhood services. Kansas Preschool Pilot Funds. Like I said, there's two funding pools. So you have at-risk funding and then Kansas Preschool Pilot. <coughs> this is a special grant. Uh, there is somewhere close to $15 million in this. And it can be used to expand early childhood programs for children birth all the way to five. It's a very competitive grant to districts. Uh, it's awarded yearly, so if we, if we receive it this year, I can apply each year, or the director can apply each year to receive that. It will be decided by the State Board of Ed in April. I have asked if we could find out if we received it beforehand, and we cannot. So this December, I did apply for that grant. It's pretty labor intensive. It requires about 40 hours. Uh, for that grant, we were advised um, by the Dane G. Hansen Foundation. They have a representative who works in early childhood, and he said, first start here. So I went ahead and I applied for about $58,500, and that money would expand three-year-old preschool and provide wraparound childcare services in the afternoon for three and four-year-old students who have no access to childcare. So if you had a student that came in for a four-year-old preschool, obviously they'd be educated in the morning five days a week, and their parents didn't have any child care in the afternoon, they could stay for child care services there. So one of the things I will tell you, and this is how we get into child care, is we continue to lose students two ways in my building. Um, one of them, and it's not the main reason, there are other reasons too, is that some parents do not have child care, and so they're not coming back. Uh, so, and the other way is parents that are moving in. And it's more often the parents that are moving in that are starting in, in the building because of no access to child care. I'll give you an example because I just had one of these start in January. I had a young family move to town. Uh, the spouse is away in the military, so the mother's at home. They have a three-year-old and they have a kindergarten student. Uh, she was going to enroll the students because I had the request and we were ready to go. In our district, she got a job in Ellsworth. She did not have child care, and so she went ahead and went to the Ellsworth district. So we might get those students back, but it is going to be difficult. So that's one of the ways that this impacts us not having child care as we continue to grow as a district. So Kelly um, approached me, and I actually can't remember if I approached Kelly or Kelly approached me back in August. And there was several stakeholders, there was businesses, there was different individuals in that discussion. And one of the things, and Kelly, please jump in it if you can add anything to this discussion. One of the things that they were seeing at that time in August is there was two licensed daycares in the entire county. And it presented a problem, um, and it's uh, not just a problem here in Lincoln County, it is a problem throughout, particularly Northwest Kansas, and the entire state. And because of that, Dane G. Hansen has stepped up and said, Let's, we want to assist you, counties and districts, with this problem. So they had a workshop back in October. I wasn't able to go. Uh, Sharon Luke went in my place because she works kind of with different entities and organizations that were involved. Dane G. Hansen is, as I said, they had someone uh, work this process with me for mentoring advice. They're offering grants. They're offering uh, low-income startup loans to providers. They're offering whatever they can in order to get quality child care, and have stability and longevity of child care in the town. And I will say, child care shortage directly impacts us all. As I said, new residents moving to town, uh, enrolling their students in school, businesses moving into the county, um, and the ability to retain workers in all fields. That is one of the thing that, things that Dane G. Hansen stresses is that there's workers, and workers have to have child care. And without quality, reliable, stable child care, that's going to be difficult. Kelly has worked really, really hard to get new child care uh, providers in the area, and right now we're up to two, and that's wonderful. And child care in schools should always be if there's a need. If there's not a need, then you know it would be our desire to step back. But definitely, if there is a need, that would be something that we would look at. One of the things also to think about, too, is that child care providers, um, it don't necessarily stay the long haul. It's a difficult profession to be in. And so why schools have gotten involved in this is because they provide a level of stability. So there's several school districts that, that have stepped up because they have child care voids in their area. 
Otis Bison was one of the very first ones that came up with this model. All of these districts are comparable in size to us or quite a bit smaller. Otis Bison is quite a bit smaller. Uh, I'll give you the example. Otis Bison, there was no child care providers in their entire county. Their teachers had to drive 30 <coughs> miles for child care. So when you have a teacher driving 30 miles, they're probably not going to drive back to work. Lebo Waverly has been running a child care model for several years in Opie. Those are just some of those districts. One of the important things to realize that if we would kind of move in this model, it doesn't require a licensed teacher. It just requires a licensed child care provider. There are different models. All of these districts have a different model. Some of them are open all year long. Um, others are only the school year. Some take birth. Uh, OPI takes birth infants all the way up to five. A lot of them take two-year-olds or two-and-a-half into five. And then their preschool is kind of woven into that as well. Uh, some take families that have children on staff. Others are, are local families. The most, and all of them will tell you the number one most difficult obstacle is if you have a child care need in your county and you want to expand child care, is finding a building. The building has to have a playground. It has to have a fence. It has to have an on-site bathroom. It has to be handicapped accessible. There's all these things. That's the number one part. Our building would meet all of those requirements. Uh, one of the things I also want to stress is at all times, Kelly and I have had this conversation a lot, we want to work in conjunction with our local child care daycare providers. At no time are we entering into this as a business role. This is done to fill a need. Kelly and I, and she organized this, and I appreciate this, had a Zoom meeting last Monday. Monday? Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah, sorry for the page, <laughs> last Wednesday with our local child care providers to talk about is this a need, where is this going, and to get their feedback on it. Because we do, we want to enter into this as, as a partnership model. A couple of just things to think about. This, having a child care facility for 298 would be an excellent recruiting tool for staff in the future. As you know, we're moving into one of the most historic teaching shortages we've probably ever seen. And it is a, is a, a competitive edge that would put, put us above, uh, again, fulfill a need, but also give us an edge as we start recruiting. Ideally, my vision would be, and probably the best thing that I think we could do, is we could have high school students who work there and job shadow, and that could develop a teaching pathway in high school and also be done for college credit as well. Uh, Cloud County has an excellent program that they have childcare. Uh, I had several students when I was a high school teacher go through this program, and then they would come back and work at the local school and get their observation hours done there. So th I think there's tremendous potential. Again, it's based on need. And I hope that you see how those two are connected. Uh, like I said, these Kansas preschool pilot funds are pretty unlimited. They're <coughs> looking for expansion of early childhood opportunities um, as we go forward. The last thing I will say is this, is if there's any time to put money into children, it's in early childhood. Research shows that for every dollar you're going to put into early childhood, you're going to get that money back. Those students more than likely will end up on grade level, and they'll be able to go through the next 12 years with their peers, ready to graduate, and meeting those academic goals that we would like them to meet. So I know that's a lot. Do you have any questions for me? Hey Denise, I think that um, we are putting in, or I'm working on it right now, a, we have all the uh, courses mapped to put a early or childhood pathway in for next year. So all of our kids that go down and do A right now, we will now get funding for them. Um, we have teachers in the building that can teach human growth and development as a dual credit course um, for our students, which will, um, they won't have to take it online, we can take it right in there, um, they can take that. It's, I believe it's one of the classes that are part of the Senate Bill 155 that's free. Um, and then they'll take, uh, through our ingenuity, there's an intro to teaching class that we'll be able to take. So we have it all mapped out, and we'll be able to get um, funding for those kids. And then they'll have a path when they, if they want to go into teaching. So that will be in place next year. Can I? Yes, chime in a little. Absolutely. Um, I guess, so, uh, like Denise, Denise mentioned, on Wednesday we, could, we had a Zoom meeting with the child care providers, and so we're up to four licensed providers um, in the county right now, three of which were able to participate. Um, and I guess in, in my very simple mind for a complicated school thing that I uh, 
I don't know how you guys saw it, keep it all straight. But so from the early childhood, the three-year-old preschool piece of this, um, you know, I don't think anybody argues or, or um, see, I mean, they, every, I think everybody sees definitely the value of kindergarten re readiness and, you know, how important that is. Um, so from a three-year-old preschool, expanding that from the one day a week to the five days a week um, during the mornings, um, the, the gist of what I got from the, the child care providers is um, it'll make things a little complicated for them in terms of scheduling, but they don't necessarily see that as um, kind of a threat to their business model. Um, you know, I, I'd asked, like, well, would it potentially open up some slots because, all right, at least in the morning, you know, because you're going to have some three-year-olds um, in preschool, so at least in that morning would you have a spot um, and it kind of seemed like, you know, for the most part, with the, the kids that they have and the parents, they didn't necessarily think it would open more spots. Um, and I think it's, it's a, it makes things a little bit more complicated from there in the things um, from a scheduling perspective. Um, but they didn't necessarily, I guess I, they didn't necessarily think that as a threat by, by any means. Um, I think they, they start getting a lot more nervous when we're talking about um, the child care side of things. Um, and so the general just there, you know, the, the questions they had, and, and I guess that, you know, it seemed like this is a couple years down the, the pike um, if, if the school was to move that direction is, you know, so is the school, would they be charging for that afternoon child care? So, you know, the, the, the morning would be the um, preschool, but the afternoon, that wraparound, um, so is there a charge for that? Because if there isn't, and they're charging, well then, you know, obviously parents are going to decide which direction they're going to go. Um, another question is, you know, is it really, if, if there's really a need there or not. You know, so right now our fourth um, child care provider that we got started, um, she has openings for um, 18 months and older. And um, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to figure that out a little bit. And, and I think part of it is, I know the need is out there, but I think there's parents that <coughs> they have figured out how to make it work, and they're just kind of going that direction. Um, unfortunately, I think we've lost kids, and for parents who are already in a routine, I think it's gonna take time to kind of get those kids back or to have new families kind of move into the area and fill those holes. Um, but I think there was definitely a concern about um, what that might do. And so I, I just wanna say, I think we really, really, really need to evaluate what that need is. And that's something I feel like I don't really even have a good handle on, is how many kids are truly out there um, for, and where are they right now? So the 18 months and over. There's, for babies, you know, zero to 18 months, there's still a need. You know, I, I know there's still kids out there, um, and there's, there's no openings for them. But the older than 18 months, I, I, I feel like we still got to kind of, figure out where are all those kids, why are they going where they are, and if what is the appropriate system for us to put in place so that we can make sure our businesses um, are full, our school, you know, the, the kindergarten readiness, where we've got proper childhood um, readiness there. Um, so that's something that I guess I'm still trying to figure out in my brain, um, and I know, you know, through all of this, we, we just have to kind of keep talking with each other and make sure that we're all on the same page, um, for sure. And that's why Kelly and I had that conversation, and I told her, I don't feel comfortable moving forward unless we get our local providers on board as well. To answer that question, it should always be done. We are not in a business money-making uh, organization. It should always be done in cooperation with our providers, and uh, it should always be done at least just to break even, not lose money, but break even. Uh, one of the things that the, the Kansas Preschool Pilot Fund says in their grant application is the money that you brought back in, how did you uh, redistribute it out? So, as I said, it should be comparable prices to your local providers. It's not free daycare, free child care. And I will always say uh, part of this movement is we use the term child care, not daycare, so that's why I say child care. But no, it's not free child care for everybody. There is a fee for that but it no way should ever undercut your local providers in their business model. Um, and two things to think about. So for three-year-old preschool, that is something we're moving forward with or would like to move forward with as we plan for next year. 
Uh, I do need to go ahead and get that started as we apply for that grant. And I'm sorry, not the grant. The, ac the actual application to receive that risk funds comes in April, um, April 20th actually, so we have to move up on that. Child care, if it's a need, if it's something we move towards, uh, Mrs. Flynn and I have talked about, I don't know if we'd be up and running by August. I think that would be something that would require more planning, and it's just going to take some time to develop, again, if there's a need for that. Any other questions? So we would house this in the existing preschool building? Yes, at this time. Just what an afternoon? Well, it, it, it depends on what we do next year. If we're looking at child care, that would probably go into the preschool building, and where the kindergarten building is, we could run three-year-old and four-year-old simultaneously. The only thing we're going to need there is a small playground. There is uh, funds through different entities for playgrounds specifically for early childhood. Which would require fencing. Which would require fence, yes. And then the kindergarten would move into, into the main building. building. As we are changing demographically, and we're getting down to probably one teacher per grade level. For most for most classes, we're going to have some space open up there. We haven't had space in the past. Um, I, as I said, when I look at all of those assurances for three-year-old, four-year preschool, we've always met all of them for three-year-olds. We just didn't have space to go 465 hours. Has it been a pretty good deal with the one day week this year? There have been good attendance. Mm -hmm. I'll let Mrs. Ringler add on to that. Yes, it really um, has been working out nice, and um, I'm just thrilled with the progress they make with just one day. It's just uh, really neat. Um, and I think going full time will just really help improve ready for the four year old. And I think sometimes um, there's that idea that they're sitting at a desk and they're working on academic concepts, and they're really not. It's really they're school readiness, you know, how to wait and take turns, sharing, and really focusing on um, the school part, getting into a building and a routine, um, and a lot of the social things, a lot of social being able to sit and listen to a story. So that way when we get to four-year-old preschool or kindergarten, we've had those skills and we understand them and we're ready to progress. So, And when I talked about special ed, it's important to know, as I said, it is the school district's responsibility to find those three-year-olds and those four-year-olds and those young children. Those special ed services are woven back into the day. So if they have speech therapy and, and they're in three-year-old, that would come in their time that they're in three-year-old preschool. And you said, as far as the child care piece goes, we would have to have a licensed child care provider. Would the school take on that license? It's no. It's it would be the same license that any local person could apply for through DCF, through the SRS DCF. It doesn't have to be a licensed teacher. Right, but somebody has to hold the license. Yes, the school holds the license, or no, the, the, the who's person in that holds the person holds the license. As for longevity, that's a great question. Um, I would like to spend some time. Going to OP would probably be our closest model. Again, they're the ones that have birth up to five. I'd like to spend some time uh, with Principal Carter there and kind of explore those possibilities. One of the reasons schools got into having the licensed child care provider is uh, child care is a wonderful thing and it's a wonderful calling for people, but a lot of people don't stay in the business because it's hard to have health insurance and a, a 401k and all of that. So if they come and they work under a district, they have a vacation plan, they have uh, a keeper's benefit, they have health insurance, things like that. And so that's kind of how those two melded together at some point. Most of this was born out of need. It just came from necessity. That's a good question, Jessica, I will ask that. One thing that, uh, just thinking about this, you might ask is whether they run to do they run to 5 o'clock with the child care piece of that, or is it the school day? Some do and some don't. Like I said, there's, there's no perfect ones. Um, Otis Bison only runs during the school day, and they only run nine months out of the year during the school year, and they only take on staffs, children, and then children that just had nobody else. 
and they, I think they only take on seven or nine. They bought an old church parsonage building, and they operate as a home daycare, but it's a part of the school. Uh, others operate 12 months out of the year. It really kind of just depends, again, on what the need was in the community. Leva Waverly is a combined district, and they have a child care center in both of their buildings. They're two towns apart. Uh, Plainville, I believe, is expanding on this model. Stockton, I believe, is as well. There's, there's several other districts. Um, I just spoken to a teacher that works in the Bueller School District, and she's trying to get information because they're looking at expanding it as well. So I think aside from the the uh, afternoon child uh, child care aside, we need to know if the board supports going ahead with a full uh, pre K three, and Mrs. Schmidt needs to know to be able to work on that funding for that piece to expand that from one day a week to five. Expanding to five days a week will meet the hours, which will, I think, you twenty six twenty two thousand dollars. Yes. What you'd say yes. If, be... if we would have done that for the past year. Yes. And actually, that's the low end of the estimate. I think we would have came in higher. We would have had to give them the MIGDs assessment to all of all of those students, but that would be the low end. I think we would have actually came in the early range, and that would have been guaranteed funding. That's not grant dependent. That's at risk funding. That doesn't include the pilot. No, that doesn't include the pilot. Um, the pilot, one of the things that the pilot will stress is there's a lot of money there. It's federal money that is coming down, and there's right now a large stream of federal money coming down for early childhood. The pilot can be used for, uh, we were told to shoot high. And then I spoke to the consultant, and he said, let's just start smaller and, and take 58500 That would be the cost of benefits for a teacher and a full salary. That's where we started. The next year I could apply for even more than that. Thank you for letting me present. I want to appreciate that Kelly Gorley came out and gave us a Valentine's Day night and Mrs. Rangler did as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. At this time, I will just move forward with the consensus that we can apply for the grant, and it, it's kind of dependent on how that all flows. But if there is no objections, then that's kind of how we'll proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I don't know if everybody is aware of the disparity of incoming students. You know, just and, and I don't have specifics for here, but I can relate from um, the current high school counselor's previous employment, where you'll have kids that'll come in and talk in kindergarten readiness that can spell their name, and you'll have other students that don't know <coughs> the names of colors, and that just puts a real break on progress. So. I think anything we can do to get our kids ready will just prepare them to excel that much quicker. Uh, I think it's a great thing. I know Mr. Schmidt has put a lot of time and effort into it, researching a lot of things. And, you know, as, as we have facility space and different things, I think it is critical we don't compete with anybody. Um, but educationally, I think it could be a, a great thing. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important to stress that we're not going to compete with anybody. We currently have. Um, I mean, that's a huge economic impact to our community when we start taking away from them as well. So, <clears throat> about impacting them. Okay. All right, uh, moving on. Number six, we have disposal of old property, um, some non functional floor scrubbers, and CD brackets. Yeah, with the high school, since we uh, were able to buy new cleaning machines for sanitation purposes with ESSER money, we have some non-functioning scrubbers that need to be disposed of. 
And when we got those new line interactive boards that you saw on our walk at the elementary school, we have a bunch of TV brackets <coughs> that used to hang TVs on the wall. And, and I'm just real adamant that if the district purchases property, they also need to approve the disposal. Even though they're just TV brackets, it's still the proper procedure to go through. So just need to get approval to dispose of two scrubbers and a multitude of old TV brackets that are currently in the metal shop scrap pile. I was going to say, can the metal shop use those? Brackets? They've been using some of them, but their scrap bin is overflowing. As soon as you get rid of them, they're useful. Right? <laughs> well, Mrs. Flynn and I actually took one when we needed to get the Wi-Fi from the stadium to the building. We took one of those and fabricated it as a stand to hold the whatever that white box is. She the was bridge. the tech side of it. The bridge. The bridge, yeah. Look at the top of the gym. We spent a few hours on the bridge line of the gym building installing our fabricated bracket out of TV parts. So, okay. And it worked. Okay. That, accept your motion to do so. Okay. Okay. Motion by Jason, seconded by David. The USD 1098 Board of Education authorized the disposal of two old non-functioning floor scrubbers and old TV mounts. Any other discussion? All in favor? Six up. <clears throat> okay. Next uh, track renovation project. Hello. Happy Valentine's Day. I was excited to come to the board meeting so I could spend time with both of my Valentines. <laughs> Um, Save you some money. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think after I talk here a little bit, Mr. Crenshaw is going to pass along some information that he got from Mike Dixon with, with track renovations. We've all, he and I, and, and also Jessica Kogman, who serves on our committee, have had several conversations about Mike or with Mike. And, um, and also, Jim Metz is here. He's hidden back in the corner. Um, as part of our committee. And just in case you're not aware, uh, Becky Cheney, uh, uh, Jenna Ferris, is, is the, they are both on our committee as well. And um, Tracy Hamilton served on the committee initially but had to step away because um, she's needing to spend time with her mom. Um, and then John Butthoff is our liaison with the board. And I'm going to just be frank and say that I haven't done a good job of keeping John in the loop until here recently. And we're going to do a better job with that. I, uh, <clears throat> first I want to say that, and you guys heard me say this a lot probably, but I covered board meetings for 20 years more or less, and uh, I'm sitting here and I'm just, it just drives home to me that the volunteer board method of municipal management is, is such a challenging thing. For you to come away from whatever it is that you do on a daily basis and then be responsible for managing this largest employer, largest tax, you know, uh, biggest tax funded entity, et cetera, in our community. It's a, it's a tremendous challenge and I appreciate your service and, and effort in that regard. Um, I, I really think it's important. We, we started this, I look at it now and I feel like we might have started this effort a little backwards, but it's kind of like when I started Kansas pregame, I just kind of jumped in. And I, when I did the first, the first issue of Kansas pregame, I laid out every page on a 13-inch MacBook, and it was the stupidest thing. I'm using the trackpad, stupidest thing that I ever did. And uh, but uh, the whole time I was like, I just got to get this done. I just got to get this done, and then it will turn into something. And I think I kind of jumped in and talked to these people, asked them to be on this committee, and we started raising funds. And here we are with sixty thousand dollars from basically five, you know, five significant contributors, and then the trackathon thing. And, and so I'm very um, excited, I'm very optimistic about the idea that we produce $60,000 with, with really not that much effort and not that great of a coordinated effort. Um, I, I think it's essential that we often revisit why we're doing this, and we're doing this because this is a staple of our community that we need to maintain. It's not, certainly track competition is an element of it, uh, and, and frankly, our track program is probably our most successful athletic program at the high school level. You know, it's the one that we have the most team championships with. It's the one that we have the most individual championships with. Um, there, there's, it, and it's probably 
produced a significant chunk of the athletic scholarship revenue that we've seen over the course of our uh, school system's time operating. Um, so certainly that's a huge part of it, but it's way more than that. The track is, is a public use facility for health and fitness. When you look at the number, I mean, any day that you drive by, there's going to be a number of our older population out there using that facility to walk. And we need to, you know, we need to bring it up to grade so that it's safe for them and it's something that they can feel good about using. Uh, the elementary school mile has been something. Our kids talk about the fact that they really miss being out there on that track and doing that. The youth, the, the field day event, uh, incorporating the track into that. And then, of course, junior high track meets, high school track meets. Um, and there are more opportunities between league meets, regional meets, and things like that to expand on what it is that we've already done in the past. It's also provides fundraising opportunities with our concession stands. Um, it's an economic development tool that brings people to town. I mean, track meets bring dozens, if not hundreds, of people to town. And, and hopefully, uh, they, some of those people get downtown, spend some money, especially now that our, that our restaurant base is expanding and doing some of those kind of things. Uh, but also, it's one of the front doors of our community. When the, the, the track and the Metner Field facility as a whole and all of the volunteer effort and money that's been invested that already, now we need a stable quality base on that, on that track and, and, and surface on that track so that it can last for years to come. And I think there are extended opportunities with youth track meets. Uh, the, the rec just had a track clinic this last weekend with over 40 kids participating. Um, there, there's, that's a, that's a three weekend event. So that, that, you know, that's, there's opportunities like that. It's, we just talked about keeping kids and families in the community. The quality of facilities is a draw for families, you know, and I, I mean, I've been to a lot of stadiums in my time covering high school sports. And I can remember the ones that have beautiful brand new tracks, and I can remember the ones that their tracks look like crap. And, and so I think it's an important part of our overall economic development process. So Mr. Crenshaw is going to talk about some of the options. And I was, I was thinking about this, you know, how I was talking about how we kind of jumped into it, and I'm not sure that we started at the right point, but nonetheless, I'm glad that we started. And as I said, when I started this thing, because I knew immediately there were going to be naysayers. I said, I, I intend to raise the money for this without getting involved in tax dollars, without getting in school funds. And I'm going to be honest, when I was saying that, I was imagining that it was going to be the $200,000 that we were going to spend to do an 8 to 10 year kind of a fix and, and put the same surface that's on it right now. Well. I, after being a part of this and, and learning about this, and, and I should say that my committee, we haven't necessarily arrived at consensus on this, but I think we all feel pretty much the same about it. We really think that we need to tear the thing up from the, from the bottom up, fix the plenary issues, pour concrete, do the whole thing. And yes, it's going to cost three quarters of a million dollars to a million dollars to do it. Do I think that we can raise 100% of the funds to do that? I don't know. I, not, not in 18 months, no. Um, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, whatever, whatever the case may be, maybe. But I guess what I, what I would really like to say is that there's two things that we need. And one is more time, and two is a cooperative effort with the school district. I think we can raise $200,000 after seeing what we've done in such a, sh a short period of time with relative ease. I don't mean to minimize that. $60,000 is a lot of money. $200,000 is a lot of money. But I've been very excited about the fact that there are a number of people in our community that are very excited, so much so to the point that they'd be willing to give ten dollars or $20,000 to support this initiative. And that means there's probably other people out there that are willing to give fifty dollars or a hundred. dollars you know? There's not a lot of them, but there's probably some. So. Time, <clears throat> I think, the, the thing about time is, is we want to get back into use, you know? We want our kids to be able to use it. We want our community, I mean, I know our community is still out there using it. Um, you know, whether that's safe for them or not, you know, that, that's, that, that's unclear. But, so I wonder if time could be given by exploring this patching option. And I know you've got this patching stuff out there, 
and uh, it's not been warm enough to see whether it would work or not. Mr. Dixon also has said that we can buy catching, patching kits from him. That was a new thing. Um, and I wonder if we could patch it and get it back to use in the short term where we could then have like a three-year strategic plan related to this that would really help us implement the fundraising effort on this and set and set deadlines, you know, a quarter one fundraising goal and, and et cetera, et cetera, and, and set some marketing goals and, and work on grants and do all those kind of things that go along with that. But the, the so what, if we can find a way to do something time-wise, that would be fantastic. And if that patch kit is maybe that solution, great. If not, um, you know, then, then, then maybe we need to explore an alternative, which is one of the many options that we'll talk again about here. Uh, but the second thing is, is that I need district and community support. And, and I haven't really asked for it, I don't think, to this point. But I think we need to explore creative financing options. I don't know what scenarios there are today, but when early in my board, at time covering the board, there used to be quality zone assurance bonds. Are you familiar with those, Mr. Crenshaw? QZAP bonds were meant to be strictly for capital outlay projects. And they were locally, they were locally funded through local banks and had ultra low interest rates. I don't think they're a program anymore. I think they've since been disbanded. But if there are financing options like that, like for example, let's say that the committee just decides, you know what, we can raise two hundred thousand dollars of of seed money with the idea that we want to have it be the down payment on a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar project. Can we earmark capital, a, capital outlay to service a creative financing option? Is that an option? I have no idea. Um, you know, can we set aside X amount of funds from capital outlay for, for 10 years or whatever it might be with the idea that that would allow us to go out and get all the money that we need and we would continue to fundraise to help to pay back the capital outlay fund? And I know I'm getting... I'm getting out there, I'm just trying to think outside of the box of what we might be able to do. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think that the committee believes that the thing to do is to, is to build an entirely new track, uh, you know, at that $750,000 to $1 million price tag. And the reason is, is because of the value. That $750 to $1 million deal in 10 years is going to be $5 million or whatever it be. I mean, with the with the price of uh, petroleum-based products and things like that. And if we can put something in that has a, a, a tremendously long life, and when you talk to Mr. Dixon, he's not gonna tell you that something's gonna last for 50 years or 100 years or something like that, because he, he's got some products that he's exploring with his business and things like that. But if we can look at something and say, we feel supremely confident that we can get three generations out of this versus eight to ten seasons or whatever it might be, then I think in the long run it will be massively worth it. But in the short in the short run, we'll need to be creative to make it happen. So I will let um, Mr. Kershaw talk about some of the stuff that he talked with Mr. Dixon about and, and Jim and I and, and Jessica can answer questions if that's if that's helpful and and we can go forward and try to get this thing done. And, it, and it, if in the short term we decide that the district or the community doesn't have the wherewithal to, to, to do a three quarters of a million dollar project and we want to we want to try to raise two hundred thousand dollars to put it, Mike Dixon says eight to ten seasons and we got like fourteen out of this one, so I always say twelve. <laughs> if we want to spend two hundred thousand dollars to get twelve seasons out of it. I, I think that's a viable option as well. And I know there are some other options of, of 350 and 500 that do some different things. But to me, it's either it's either patch it for 10 years or tear the whole thing up and redo it. To, to me, the, the mid-level options are a complete waste of time because in the long run, we're going to have to pay additional money to get those resurfaced and, and add to their life and those kind of things. So does anybody have any questions for me? I think you'll probably have a little discussion here, and I'm here to to answer any that you might have. So, thanks. You guys are all a bunch of sweethearts.
necessarily don't have anything new to share. I did print off a hard copy of what I sent you via email with three, three options. Um, again, I think the track committee just needs to hear from the board. This is what we want to do. This is your bullseye. Um, you know, we can have financial discussions. I've already talked to a, a capital project firm that, that would finance things like this. That's a scary thing, I would tell you, because at the point that it gets financed, I would think there would be less interest in donations because guess what? We're already on the hook for it. Uh, the other thing that concerns me is just this seven to eight year overlay that needs to be done to maintain. Even with the best model of the concrete with all reinforced steel so we don't see those major cracks, we would still have to plan and bank $25,000 a year so that every seven to eight years we could put a new wear coat on it at a, at a current cost of $200,000. So the ongoing maintenance is, is something that can't be ignored or we'll end up in the same situation. And, and I have no idea how maintenance was done in the past. It, it, the, the word is that there was a maintenance plan and then it had to be shut down because of budget issues in the past. That's just word of mouth stuff. Um, but I agree with absolutely everything that John said. That facility is a beautiful facility except for the black ring around it. Uh, so how it gets done, I don't have any magical answers. If this board wants to take on that kind of debt, then this board makes that decision. Uh, we can continue to, to discuss it. Uh, but I'm also in total agreement uh, that it does need to be tore out in the very best possible products put down for longevity. And, and I won't bore you with this because you've already read it and that hasn't changed since I sent it to you. Hey, do, did you have some information that you wanted to share? Well, <clears throat> I, I took the three options and tried to do a kind of a cost analysis of it. And once I started to dig into it, because my, my thing was with option one, if we look at that what are we spending if we take that out over like a 40 year time period? And I, I, I tried to do that with each of those options. But as I dug deeper into this, I started having more and more questions. And I then felt like those questions truly need to probably come from Mike Dixon at some point because I know he, he um, has given information, but the option one with the one to four years, I know at one point he was, he had mentioned a longer time period. So. Well, it, that's, if I could just interrupt. Sure. The cracks in one to four years, it doesn't mean it would be non-functional. Gotcha. But okay. that, those cracks would, he's seen it as early as in the first year on an unstable base like we have. What he can guarantee is that it will crack. The extent of cracking and curling to make it unusable who knows? It could be that seven eight, but but it will it will fail, and it will allow water again to get into that base and continue to deteriorate. So that's his was cracking, not longevity. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and there were just things like that as I started to dig into this. What does it look like over a thirty or 40, 40 year period? Um, what is the most cost effective option? And and. I would think he would be able to provide that for us. I don't, you know, I don't know. I haven't ever spoken with him. I don't know if. Well, his recommendation is option three, and I don't think just because he's the contractor, uh, I, I believe in this guy, and and everything, every conversation I've had, I believe is credible, and he is really looking out for our best long-term solution, not simply our most expensive solution. Would you agree with that? I, I, I do agree. I, I do think that I, I, I sure would like to have somebody else be part of this conversation. I mean, other than, than Mike Dixon. It seems there should be another contractor that should be interested in, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Obviously, I know Mammoth does these kind of things, but they are <clears throat> top shelf, 
you know, looking at, at doing complete kind of turnkey operations and, and it feels like they're out of our, out of our price range. It, it certainly would be nice to have somebody else coming to the table and saying, I can do this. But as far as I can understand, Mike Dixon is the, is the only one that's willing to resurface it. That there's nobody else out there that does that. I mean, just would take the existing structure, tear up the surface, the, just kind of peel the surface off, and then put another similar, similar surface back down. I really don't get the impression that there's very many other people out there that offer that, that option. Um, but yes, I think he is. Right. Like, he, he works with small districts because mm -hmm. he is, is owner-operated. So when he and I talk and he says, uh, and I say there's no gravel underneath, and he says, my cost includes bringing milling machines to mill that asphalt so you don't have to buy gravel. And we will take current existing material and convert it to usable material. Nobody else is bringing those kind of ideas to the table. So I think he's aware of the financial situation because he's dealt with it a lot. And he's looking at ways to help us get this project done um, because even option three at seven to 750, that's significantly less than 1.2, yes. which we received from some other uh, entities. You know, so again, I, I find the guy credible. His uh, his passion for it led him to even patent products in track construction. Uh, so I just would share that he is willing to try to help us figure this thing out, not just give us a price. And I think that has value. And he was the guy that did our track 15 years ago, yeah. right? So he's been here before. Yeah, yeah, he knows what he's working with. I also think there's some value to the fact that. You know, yeah, his price tag's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the high end, but is there any of that work that can be done in kind? We, I have talked with him about that and said I feel confident we have people that can handle demo and that that can help with some of those things. I mean, <coughs> the facility itself shows the the press box, the stadium bleachers that they have all had in kind contributions to them. The, the drainage issue the concrete i mean yeah. so and that's probably where the owner operator guy like mike would be willing to work that way whereas mammoth or somebody else is just going to write their crew and they're going to do it that's right i i won't say this as an absolute fact because my memory's not that great but i believe option three is is a meter conversion as well that is my understanding what? as well Th no, that's the most expensive one yeah. yes, yes it is, is. We it, would probably have to sorry. move some lights for right. eight lane, oh, okay. but I, I'm oh, I'm 99% sure that that was converting to meter as well. I, I think it is too. Yes. I would, I would agree with that. Based on our prior conversations, that includes um, redoing the curbing and working <clears> on <throat> some of the drainage issues. Now, also full disclosure, he said, I don't know what's that corner down there where that giant cottonwood tree used to be that they took out. And do you remember that it used to have that hump in it and they took it? Uh, he said, I don't know what's going on down there. I can't guarantee, you know, what, I'm, what my time investment's gonna be with that. So that could be a factor as well. Well, you have to go into this like any remodel project. As soon as you peel one layer off, you're not gonna be without surprise. You can just probably bank on it. Did he indicate in any way what his patching kits cost? We tried a patching kit. Mrs. Flynn and I spent quite a bit of time out there. Um, that's a pain in the neck. And if you look at the track, every strip that goes across all seven lanes was a patching kit. All that. So that's why I, I thought of this crazy idea of using more of a molten product. And then Mrs. Flynn threw into the mix. We have a 55-gallon drum of those rubber granules, so that highway crack patch that's molten, sprinkled with that, I would assume would have more flexibility. And, you know, we just hadn't been warm enough to do some experiments yet. I guess the only thing that kind of concerns me is every, every option, one, two, and three, involves spending $200,000 every seven to eight years. So, 
I, my conversation with Mike, the, the most expensive option, I was not aware that, that, that there was a $200,000 service. I thought that was, we spent $750,000 and we may have some additional service costs down the road, but I, I, at, at first, the first time I talked with him, he said that's gonna last a really long time. He said, I am not going to say forever, but that's going to last a really long time. And he did not mention um, any additional service costs beyond that. So, is that a spray coat? Sorry. Is that a spray coat? But he you're... calls it a wear coat. It's I think it has out. to do with the permeability. I know in districts I've been in, they've come out, and if it was a red track or the, the uh, cinder color track, it would get a fresh coat of something on top of it, and they would restripe it, restripe the lanes at that point. That's been a track maintenance program for ever since they came up with these latex tracks. And, and he did mention in every one of them that you would have to do a wear coat, topping, whatever. I, I just didn't hear that about the third option. I, yes, he said that there would be a wear coat in the, in, the middling, in the middling one. But again, that's why it would be great if Mike Dixon were here. And I couldn't get him here tonight, so yeah. I, I asked, but it was a pretty short notice when I got away. He would he would be more than happy to come here. I want to make sure it's worth his time. Union Town's about four hours away from here, but he wants to bring samples and he wants to he wants to provide samples for even the committee to be able to say, here, feel this, and this is what we're doing, and really get that visual and, and conceptual idea ingrained in people's heads. Um, I would be more than happy to try to get him here to the March board meeting. And he has tracks in Stockton and Goodland. Um, those were two of the close ones that he brought up. I would say whether we become a customer or not, he'll ultimately make it worth his time because he'll probably find another district or two in the relative proximity that he'll meet and, and talk with. I, mean. I think having the samples would be fantastic. Not only for us as a board to see and actually you know, lay hands and eyes on what we're talking about, but from the committee standpoint, being able to retain those and use them as fundraising models, you know, have a community <coughs> informational meeting and say this is what we're asking for. Um, I think that makes a huge difference. And we're in a weird market. The reason he would recommend concrete is because. Uh, it's much cheaper than asphalt right now, given the petroleum that's in it. So it's just kind of an odd, an odd market, but it, I, it is going up exponentially all the time, right now. And regardless of what that group saying about what goes up must come down, not necessarily in pricing. As far as the board, I think we're all kind of in similar agreement that you are, you know, with your committee that we don't want to just slap a band-aid on it, you know, temporarily. Um, as far as the financial aspect of it, that's that's the part that, yeah, you said get creative. That's because the farther out we go, I mean, I, I know it's going to take time to raise that money, but every year that goes, these numbers are going to keep going up too. So is it? Is it a number that we're constantly chasing, trying to reach? I don't know the answer. I would say from a committee standpoint, I think it's a lot easier for us to attain and retain donors when we are able to give them an actual number. Right. Yes. Yes. And you can't ask donors to donate money for an undetermined amount of time either. You know, you can't say, Hopefully, we'll get this used sometime in the next 10 years. Yeah. I don't know. So, I understand where you're coming from. I just don't know. You know, the district isn't exactly flush with cash to sure. go around either. So. I think that, I mean, it will take us a minimum of three years to raise $750,000 cash to, to pay. You know, that's the minimum. And then, of course, like we're saying, it's going to be 20% more by that point or whatever. So I think the consideration for the board is, if you will allow me, is whether or not they're willing 
capable, willing, whatever the terminology is, both, uh, to essentially co-sign or guarantee, um, you know, that's, I, I, I realize neither a borrower nor a lender be, I get it, but that's, we're, you know, at, for it to happen, that is probably what would have to happen. And that's a discussion for the board to have amongst themselves and, and that kind of thing. I mean, because I feel like we can raise two to $300,000 in 18 months, you know, or perhaps, perhaps less. I mean, we definitely could raise it in less if we had a picture of what we were shooting for and we were, you know, we're able to be more aggressive about things. And again, I really, I need some assistance we need some assistance with, with, with grant writing, with, with marketing, some of those kind of things. This is not a, this is a multi-member effort where, where to raise the money. So it would be nice. To, I mean, I can write a grant, but I would sure rather have somebody write it that has failed at it before rather than me failing at asking Angie Hansen for $150,000 or whoever it might be. And my first big failure being the biggest piece of money that we need for this project. So, um, yeah. And there's really not any decision to be made to regarding any of that tonight. It's just um, just a consideration. So, just going back to our last meeting, a lot of the grants that we are aware of are available for schools. That would I think there's still grants out there that are available to schools. I think when you get into um, the community-based piece and the health avenue of it, a lot of those are available to schools. Which is where you get a lot of that good money. When you can hit every single one of the spokes on their wheels that they're asking for. And we haven't had any further discussions with other entities within the county. That's, I personally think that's going to add another at least 12 months to the process. Just having, you know, I mean, you're going to have to get on the city's meeting agenda, the county's meeting agenda, and their first time's going to be discussion, and then it's going to be, a, you know, they're going to come back in 60 days and we'll talk about it again or whatever. I'm not saying they're, I, also, I don't know about it. Again, it would be great if we had someone that, had the expertise about all this, and I, I haven't really talked to Kelly very much about this yet. You know, I'm, I, you know, she she obviously probably has some ideas about it as well, and um, certainly it's a time thing. We all, you know, we're all we're all trying to carve out time for everything it is that we need to do. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted, to, you know, just wanted to share the email from the KASB attorney about public use policy. And um, I believe I mentioned it at the special board meeting that their initial advice was that uh, parents have to release their student to another parent or guardian um, in some sort of a paper release form. And, and I shared with you, I had no idea how we would manage that. Um, but I just wanted you to see the total email. Um, his biggest thing is, and I think it uh, sums it up, there is no good answer here. The board decided to allow public to use public property when not in use by the school. It comes with risks, and this is an extension of that risk. If your general liability covers and you have releases, you've done what you can to mitigate it, but you can mitigate the risk, but you can never eliminate it. So I would tell you, as the superintendent sharing with the board, we don't have the wherewithal to manage that paper trail. So 
if you want to open the, the, the policy up, then it's either going to be an open gym or current policy. Because uh, with the other things that I'm going to share coming up here, we can't do what we're looking at being required to do now with the staffing that we have. And there is no way we can track down at 8 o'clock at night if every kid with an adult has a release form on file from their parent to be with that specific adult. It can't be anyone can take my kid there. You know, so it's just a nightmare to manage that. But it's an issue that we started discussing, and I think we need to put it to bed so that everybody knows. And you checked with our insurance carrier. We have general liability. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. what do they have anything that covers public use? Not specifically, Just pretty broad. Keep it simple if, if you want to continue to read it's my opinion. I think it's something we need to continue doing. Um, I think the public has access to the gymnasium is <coughs> very important to our community. Um, I think it gets a lot of use. I don't think it's something that we want to eliminate in totality. So if we can come up with some sort of happy medium or continue with what we're doing now until maybe David's willing to share what he's drawn up for this other school district um, and see if that's helpful to our situation. <laughs> Um, but I don't think it's something we want to take away. I was going to say, I think our current policy covers pretty decent. It was just a matter of parents were wishing more kids could go. And uh, I think at this current time, without causing more headache than heartache, we continue with the policy we have. And those that are using it are still using it. I guess I don't know that there was discussion of going backwards or shutting it off. It was just how we might be able to. General liability doesn't cover uh, if a non-parent supervision, are we still covered in that in that case? He's not a lawyer. <coughs> I'm not a lawyer. There would be, I would think there would be risk on us and risk on the supervising adult. to go up there with their grandkids, currently they've been discouraged or told they aren't able to. So, I, I mean, if my mom wanted to go up there with Sloan to shoot a ground, she wouldn't be able to. And I think that's unfortunate. I would trust my mom with my child, obviously. And you mentioned a uh, responsible adult. I, you know, I know some very responsible 19 year olds and I know some very irresponsible 40 year olds so that kind of gets a, a gray you know what does that mean and things like that uh, maybe the board would entertain just adding the word parent grandparent or guardian if that would allow any flexibility at all it's I mean it's case specific but um, if you 
want to address it, then you address it. If you say let it stand as it is for now with further thought, we can table and then move, forward, move on. I have a hard time changing it at this point without having more information, having the example um, that he's done with another school. He worked for the Lord School District, so I'm guessing their personnel situation was probably significant, more significant than yeah. ours. So no matter what form he gives you, I'm going to tell you we can't manage it. Now, if you say, oh, yes, you will, well, then I guess we'll figure something out, but that's a burden we don't need. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to get that waiver straight. We can have a sign track that all down. Uh, but wouldn't that just come with getting their card? Or we're saying they don't well, need a card? Well, I think what they're saying here is every child has to have a waiver sign. Oh, okay, every child, yeah. not, not the parent. So if my, yeah. if my child wants to go to the gym with you, Nate, I would have to sign a release you can take them. If they right. wanted to go with you, Jessica, there'd have to be a release that you could take them, right. etc. And that's where I see the... That's where it becomes the headache. Right. Yeah. It would be sure. different if it was a blanket release saying... Yes. And you know, David would I tell you this, all three of my this children could as well as any lawyer, it'll be worth the paper it's written on if somebody wants to pursue something anyway. Right. Do you think it's possibly worthwhile to look at changing the verbiage to parent, grandparent, guardian? I think you still get into some technicalities as to what a guardian is, but. Well, yeah, we'd have to have probably a legal guardian, you know. Um, paper guardian. But that will alleviate some of the issue. Accepted. That's that's not acceptable. Not the way it's written on our. No, it says group activity or something. I, I think I think it falls under a little bit of interpretation, doesn't? Well, you could probably say that. The, most coaches do a Sunday shoot around, you know, things like that. But that's an organized team. It depends on what group. You know, if it's not the whole team, then it wouldn't fall under this particular policy. If it was. You know, I'm going to take my four worst free throw shooters and we're going to go up and practice free throws. That's not part of our policy. Okay, so that wouldn't be covered. Something like you know, pitchers and catchers or posts or forwards or... Technically, no. Okay. Yeah. Which is why the concern was, was brought up, is it's very limiting. And it is. But that's how... You know, I don't want to sound like a complete jerk, but that's how you protect yourself a little bit. So currently, one of our coaches would not be able to go up there and work with a certain group of kids after hours. Technically, by that, I would say no. I think that's kind of unfortunate. I mean, I get that there's risk, but they're there working with those kids during other times. Um, there's just less kids. <laughs> but they, but they, they, they can call for an <laughs> open day. gym <laughs> shoot around, yeah. which they do. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's a basketball coach that hasn't had a weekend shoot around kind of a thing. They can't call it practice, right. but they can say open gym shoot around, and it's and then everyone's allowed in it. Then it falls under our team activity, which goes under that umbrella. Yeah, it's not like a coach can't go shoot with them. It's just they have to get. It's got to be open. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do we know what the policy was prior to it getting changed? Four, five, six years ago, whenever it moved to this, or was there no policy? That's always 
always been the written policy. It didn't change at any point. There were some people that questioned it and wanted it to. But that's how it was set up from the beginning. We had to discontinue some cards. Yes, we did. Because of issues. Sure. But that was based on hours of admin watching phone, too. And some cards were pulled. You know, okay. so, yeah, and, and there were, there's okay. been a lot of time that's been devoted to all of that. OK, practice. yes, my understanding was the verbiage had been changed at some point. So, yeah. OK. And when yeah. you come in to get a card, you have to sign that agreement to all of that. And so. And I would say this, that, and you can correct me if it's wrong, but when that, those incidents, I, I think this helps prevent instances. And I believe at some point in time there was damage or whatever else, but this is in, intended to curtail liability and damage. At the same time, I think that's why whatever previous board did it made it kind of tight, so that it wasn't. I think most of the community realizes or thinks that you know they ought to have the right to be able to do that. It doesn't cost the district anything, but like Greta just said, you know, it does cost more than. or move on because uh, we can table it and try and bring back some verbiage and see if we have a couple of options that would be worth voting on. So, table? about 20 hot lunches, which is about what we averaged before, but our grab-and-go on average is between 90 and 95 kids a day. So it just kind of tells you how hungry our kids are by 9 o'clock. <coughs> um, in fact, we the, the line <laughs> is down the hallway for kids to go through the whole process after. So we're going to have to look probably, I'm going to talk to my staff on Monday and decide if we need to extend the six minutes, maybe a little longer. Not that the kitchen's not getting them through, it just takes that long for them to walk through the process. Yes. Um, also, looking at, there's actually a snack after school for, and I was thinking more for our athletes. Um, it's uh, like an after school snack program. However, you have to have an academic piece to it and open it to all students. So we would have to, like, they'd have to stay there. The kids can go to practice, but the kids that don't have practice would have to stay and eat their snack, and there'd have to be some sort of, like, study hall. I'm not really sure how to manage that yet, but I'm working on it. So maybe for next year, because I, I think that, especially our athletes who are burning thousands of calories a day, they're hungry. Um, so looking at that, also just kind of giving an update on the cell phone policy after a couple days of rockiness. The kids have been very receptive, and actually we've had no, I need to find some wood, no discipline problems with our cell phones since then. So, it was good. Okay. <clears throat> and I would piggyback on what Mrs. Flynn said. So we have what's called a fresh fruit and vegetable grant program that we applied for. Norma and I applied for it last summer. And it, we started out just one day a week that they could have a fresh uh, fruit or vegetable in the afternoon. We've now expanded that to four days. We don't do it on Wednesdays because we don't have enough time. Wednesday afternoons with the early release. I, students love it. Uh, we haven't even scratched the surface of the amount of money that's allocated to us. And the state has said, please use up all of the money that we've given you. Um, so we're looking at ways to expand that program, bring in new fresh fruits and vegetables. And for us, it's been really successful. I know it feels great. That would Probably help you. Oh. <laughs> uh, today they had cucumbers and candy at the same time, so it was kind of an interesting mix. So. <laughs> Thank you. And that brings us to. Okay. I'll try to fly through this. I've got a decent amount of information to share with you. I'd like to give you an update on the uh, technology center. Um, we are 
We are in possession of that building. Uh, I am working on figuring out where to put two classrooms. Uh, I checked with an engineer on the uh, welding room side of it. We do have to have an exhaust system to each and every welding boot. So we're working on that. Uh, that being said, uh, the, the code is one restroom per 15 occupants. And since we're looking at having 30, if we can have 15 students on each side in each program, I've got to figure out a place to build a bathroom that's handicap accessible. I will tell you, I was on the County Commission agenda this morning and I shared this project with them um, just so that they can see what we were doing. Uh, I, and I asked them for some support to make up for the uh, shortfall in the grant that, that we received from Dane G. Hansen. And they were very excited about the project. They thought it would be a great thing for the county in many aspects not only workforce readiness for whatever will come into the manufacturing plant, but also um, just economic development, having another jewel in our crown here that we offer kids uh, for an excellence in education, which is, is, has always been my goal. It's my understanding after they left, they, after I left, they continue to have some discussion and are not opposed to the concept of helping uh, be a part of this project or since it is countywide and, and even outside the county if kids want to come. So that's exciting stuff. Um, the parking lot, you know, I asked for uh, some funds to, uh, they said that we were going to get some engineering specs. They were out uh, um, surveying today to work on drainages and pitches and things like that. I have a couple of pictures because there was questions about um, the north end of the high school and this is a beautiful parking lot but if you look at there's one that has big circles in the gray area that's a gravel concept and there's one with black dots in the gray and that's the concrete they're estimating at 3,150 yards well I just paid $150 a yard for concrete that's a $470,000 parking lot so I'm thinking we're probably doing okay with gravel and we can square it up with gravel. And I think if we get those parking concrete things, we can make it look like a parking lot with some organization. Uh, so I am thinking the north parking lot's kind of off the table for now. Um, but it's always good to have information. Good to have information. And, and honestly, some of those, like the pine lawns and the linear parking devices aren't that expensive really. I think we could make it look like a parking lot, not just willy-nilly out there. Uh, but if you don't know if you don't ask, so there you go. Uh, uh, we started on lighting solutions <coughs> for on, that. On that parking lot? No. Okay. No. I didn't know if we checked into those or not. Not yet. Okay. So the next thing I have to share with you is House Bill 2662. And you might want to write that down because this, this could use action from board members, e even from community members if they thought this was crazy. I, I think I told you when we had our last legislative election that things were going to get interesting in education. So House Bill 2662 is cited as the Parents' Bill of Rights and Academic Transparency <coughs> Act. This is the bill. Ten pages, nine pages of text. And let me show you some highlights. This is in the House right now. This is going to put a burden. If, if I told you that the parent release forms were going to be a burden, this is insanity. And, and I would tell that to any legislature that would dare to come in here. So let me tell you what this does. This is requiring a school district to put a portal on their website called the Parent Transparency Portal. What they're trying to accomplish is that a parent has the right to direct the education and care of their child. They currently do. The right to request access and inspect written and electronic records maintained by a school. They currently do. The right to be informed of and inspect curriculum, instructional materials, and other materials that are made available or taught to a child. They currently do. 
the right to attend publicly designated meetings of local school boards and question their address. They do. The right to make health care and medical decisions. They do. It just goes on and on. But listen to this. The Board of Education of each school district shall establish an internet-based transparency tool titled the, Parency transparency, or the Parent Transparency Portal on the school's website with a link to such parent to the portal display, blah, blah, blah. It will provide this, the Parents' Bill of Rights, a list organized by school grade level area of instruction that includes academic, social, emotional learning materials, activity, and curriculum used for student instruction at any school of the district, and it will include title, author, organization, website address, and other information necessary for that identification. It will link curriculum standards established by the State Board. It will list organized by school grade level area of instruction and include the following information for each test, questionnaire, survey, and examination and amendments thereto that is administered in any school. A copy of each test, questionnaire, survey, or examination. The name of the company or, or entity that produces or provides the test, questionnaire, examination. An, an explanation of the purposes of the data collection and how the data is intended to be used. An explanation of how test, questionnaire, survey, or examination benefits student learning. An explanation of whether the school district will receive or maintain resulting data and how it will use data. A list organized by school grade level area of instruction that includes professional development courses, training materials, and related activities that were provided or offered to any teacher administrator. Such list will include the title, author, organization, website. I can go on and on and on. And they are trying to push this through. And it will, it, you know, I have had so many conversations with state board members, the commissioner of education, our state representative, our state senator, and I have told them, you are killing education and you are really killing small schools because we cannot do what you continue to require us to do. And I'm so stinking livid about this kind of nonsense that's going on in Topeka. They are taking away a local school board's right to manage and maintain local education and we know what's best for our kids. And let me back up a second. Some people may be in support of this bill. I just am personally not because I see the negative impact on local control and being in charge of our kids. We all have unique communities that we serve throughout the state and to broad brush things like this and to challenge what we can do for our kids who we know and our staff who we know I think is egregious. I think it's punitive, and, and I just wanted you to be aware that that's what's going on. House Bill 2662, and you might be able to shoot an email off to our representative that might be a little calmer than where I just went. But I just am not liking what I'm seeing, what's happening, and I don't know that it's going to get better. Sounds like we need a paid position to manage all this, too. Yeah, I would agree with that. And as to a five or six A school, they can probably weed this out of about, about ten people and they it's taken care of. But, well, but even in a five to six A school, all the tests and all the curriculum that's, 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 that's the best the test they want a year's worth of curriculum up there when I mean these teachers and going into the year I, haven't even met their kids. And you know what? When you meet a, a class or a student and and I would guess you could concur with this, Mrs. Pittenger. You move as you see the need. You can't publish what one. The comparison I heard was that's the same as requiring a doctor to put together a treatment plan for a patient they haven't met yet. It is crazy. So anyway, I just wanted to share that as a little uplifting. If you live east of 14, Susan Kincannon would be your representative in the house. If you live in Lincoln or west of 14, Troy Waymaster would be the one to get a hold of. So.
Now, I will say this, every time I talk to, the, to people, well, not every time, a lot of times it falls on deaf ears because their minds are already made up. But I do sleep a little bit better at night when I pound the table and I tell a state board member that don't talk to me about equity and education because my kids aren't getting what they deserve. Uh, and when I talk about the amount of hoops that we have to jump through, we do, and we had this conversation in the office, we are required to do every report, every project, every accreditation model that a 6A school does with six assistant superintendents and somebody in charge of turning the lights on and a different person turning the lights off. And they are killing us with this sort of stuff. So anyway, sorry. Flash. <clears throat> and, uh, and on a positive note, I would say again, at the end of my report, that Spanish thing, outstanding. You know, grab and go, outstanding. We, we are doing so many good things, and it's a, it's a good time to be here. Executive session. Uh, we need an executive session for negotiations. Uh, <coughs> ten minutes. Uh, so okay. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Jason, seconded by David, that the USD 298 Board of Education go into executive session at. 8.48 p.m. for 10 minutes with the superintendent for the purpose of discussing the latest proposal relating to employer-employee negotiation and that the Board of Education return to open meeting at 8.58 in the Board of Education conference room. The executive session is required to protect the district's right to its negotiating position and the public position under coma exemption. Any other discussion? All in favor?